Welcome back to the Silver River Art Studio, where we create beauty where none existed. But this time, we're going to create beauty where mud existed. This week, I'm going to show you how I made this fabulous replica of an 800-year-old Anasazi Ancestral Puebloan ring canteen using authentic materials and techniques. So who were the Anasazi? They are an ancient Native American group who inhabited an area in the American Southwest that is now called the Four Corners, because it is the only place in the United States where the corners of four states meet. They are best known for their fabulous ruins, such as Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. As an archaeologist, I'm frequently asked, what happened to the Anasazi? Why did they disappear? Well, the simple answer is, they weren't, and they didn't. Let's start with the last one first. The Anasazi, more properly called the Ancestral Puebloans, are the ancestors of the modern Pueblo peoples who are still alive and thriving in New Mexico and Arizona. The Ancestral Puebloans didn't disappear. They moved due to a phenomenon that we are all too familiar with in our day, climate change. Not long after the original of my pot was made, the Northern Southwest underwent a generations long drought and the people moved to where their descendants still live. Earlier, I said that the Anasazi weren't, and they didn't. So let's go back to the first part of that. The Anasazi weren't the Anasazi. I also said that they were more properly called the Ancestral Puebloans, because they are. Anasazi is an old term that was applied to them later by other groups. We don't actually know what they called themselves, certainly something in their own language, and since Anasazi is derived from the Navajo term for ancient enemy, they definitely weren't calling themselves that. The pot I'm replicating today is from the northern margins of where the ancestral Puebloans lived. It's part of the collections at Edge of the Cedars State Park in Blanding, Utah. Edge of the Cedars has some fabulous artifacts, including a 900-year-old sash made of over a thousand macaw parrot feathers. They also have a mountain sheep pot that is a perennial favorite with replicators. This ring canteen is a pretty unusual shape in the archaeological record. I've only seen a few, and this is probably one of the nicest. It is believed that it represents a snake based on the painted patterns in the two ro different rows of motifs. If you aren't fond of snakes, you might want to close your eyes for a few seconds here. Rattlesnakes curl themselves up just like that, especially when it's cool out. Remember, they're cool, cold-blooded. I encountered one under a pinion tree one fall who looked just like that. I just waved goodbye, and he stuck his tongue out at me as I left. Okay, you can open your eyes now. The ancestral Puebloans are justly famous for their black and white pottery. Black and white pottery is a relatively rare phenomenon worldwide, simply because it is very difficult to do well. It takes a combination of the right natural materials and just the right techniques. So what are those materials? Let's have a look. For starters, of course, you need clay. The territory of the ancestral Puebloans was blessed with a variety of clay types. This is what I used as the body clay, which is just a clay that I used to make the body of the pot. Archaeologists and potters aren't very creative about naming things. This is just some clay that I dug out of the hillside in southwestern Colorado. I didn't do too much with it. I mixed it up with some water so that the light stuff that wasn't clay like roots or twigs, floated to the top, and the heavier stuff, like pebbles, sank to the bottom. Then I saved the stuff in the middle and let it dry. This stuff looks pretty black right now, but that's just because there's a lot of organics in it. It was actually pretty close to a coal seam, so that gives you an idea of what kind of swampy, goopy conditions it originated in millions of years ago. But this black clay isn't what makes the black and the black on white. When it's fired, it will turn light gray just as you can see with this Chaco-style cylinder jar. The next thing we need is temper. Temper is any fine material, organic or inorganic, that can be mixed into the clay. It helps to reduce the amount of shrinkage in your clay, and thus reduces the likelihood that it will crack. It also helps to provide some resistance to thermal shock, which is important. We aren't going to use an electric kiln where we can raise the temperature slowly and gently, we're going to slink it into a roaring great bonfire and hope for the best. The ancestral Puebloans used several different types of temper. 
ground up pottery sherds, modern potters call this grog, sand, crushed rock, and volcanic ash were all used. Some of it may have been a matter of tradition, some may have been based on what was available. I used a mixture of ground up sherds and sand for this pot. These days, because potters would rather spend time making pots than grinding them up, you can also buy grog pre-ground. The technique I'm going to use to create my pot is the coil and scrape method. You roll the clay into a coil and, well, you get the idea. To scrape our pot, I'm going to use some pieces of gourd that I've shaped to provide me with some curved edges. I'm also going to use this shallow round bottom bowl, which is called a pookie. I have no idea who came up with the name Pookie, but it clearly wasn't an archaeologist. It's too original. Brilliant nomenclature strikes again. Normally, a Pookie is used to form the bottom of the pot and allow you to rotate it easily to build it. The ancient Puebloans didn't have pottery wheels. To us, it makes sense that a pot should have a flat bottom, because we have flat tables, and a round bottom pot would just tip over. But since the Puebloans didn't have tables, a round bottom pot actually makes a lot more sense because it is less likely to tip over and spill on uneven surfaces. It can literally roll with it. Today I'm just going to use my pookie to help curve the outside surfaces of my pot and provide a way to rotate it, and I'm going to cushion it with some cotton cloth. And yes, the ancestral Puebloans did have cotton. In fact, Pima cotton, which is considered the finest in the world, originated in the, in the Americas and is named for the Pima Indians of South Central Arizona. Incidentally, the Pimas weren't Pimas either. They are the Akamel Otham. It appears that Pima is derived from the Otham word meaning, I don't know, which is what they kept answering the Spanish when the Spanish first showed up and kept trying to talk to the Otham in, well, Spanish. I'm also going to use this little piece of buckskin to help smooth the surface of the pot. A couple of other goodies that I'm going to use to trim my pot and cut the hole are this little wooden knife and this projectile point. You can laugh at a pink point, but at least it's easy to find when everything is covered with gray clay. Okay, let's get started. I've filmed this in hyperlapse, so I apologize if it seems a bit frenetic. I spent some time trying to figure out how they made this pot whether they had rolled it out in a coil like you see me doing here, or whether or not they started out with a ball of clay and just stuck a thumb through it. And after some experimentation, I decided that the coil worked much better. So you see me thumping it on the ends of it on the desk periodically, and that's just to help keep those, corner, those ends nice and square. So now we're just trying to bend it around slowly, slowly, so that it will make our donut. If you try to turn it too fast, you'll wind up cracking your clay. So you need to just be gentle with it. Now I've joined up those ends and I've got my donut. Now I'm just trying to smooth out the surface a little bit, even it out. want to make the amounts of clay all the way around that circle as even as I can because that's really going to affect the shape of the walls as they come up. So this may not seem like much but it's actually a pretty critical step. So now you see that I'm starting to push a little bit of a channel into that donut, into the top of the donut with my fingers. And so I'm going to keep doing that. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the bottom fairly consistently thin. So I want it about the thickness that I want it to be at the end. And then the sides, at this point, I want those really thick. Because I'm going to need to use all of that clay to come all the way up and over the top. So again, just working around. Really, it's the sort of thing that you can do with your eyes closed, and sometimes it actually goes better with your eyes closed because you rely more on your sense of touch than you do on your vision. And I'm just using one of my little gourd pieces there to scrape it out, and I've flipped it upside down, 
Now I'm just to, trying to keep this shape as consistent as I can. If I get any thin spots, those are more likely to crack. So again, just scraping it down, trying to get a nice roundish donut shape. And then flip it over again. Now I'm starting to work on that center wall, trying to bring that up as well. Now we're starting to bring that center out, just a little bit of a flare there. And trying to curve those walls those outer walls in so that they'll begin to meet the center walls. You can see I've got a bit of a crack developing on one side there, so I have to really work that over. And you can see why the shape of the gourd scraper is pretty important because it allows me to shape that the walls both from the inside and from the outside these walls you can see are starting to get pretty thin this is pretty much to where I want them in terms of their thickness but they still need to turn in for me. Again, just feeling every little spot there, trying to make sure that every little spot is the same thickness. If it's not, then I give it a bit of a pinch. And if it's too thin, I pinch a little bit on either side to kind of squeeze the clay over. Now we're just trying to get this nice and round, get that shape that I want. And now I'm just taking a piece of cotton cloth, dish towel actually, putting it inside to help hold that shape. Because now I'm gonna work on the bottom a bunch. And so I've got my pookie and you can see I've got some cloth in it to help protect my, my pot. And so now I'm using the pookie to rotate so that I don't have to pick up my pot every time and set it down. That starts to stress the walls when they start to get this thin. So you can see I'm really just using my fingers and a little bit of water just to smooth that out, try and get a nice finish on it. I'm scraping off a little bit of extra there. Now, I'm flipping it over and I'm gonna stuff a little bit in the hole so that it supports it. Needed a little bit less stuffing there, so we changed it. And now we're starting to work on those sides again. You can see I'm starting to get a little bit of cracking around the sides again, so that's something I have to keep an eye on. Once those cracks get bad, they're really hard to keep up with, but if you catch them when they're fairly small, you can get by with it. So now I'm really thinning out those walls and turning them inwards.
And now I'm starting on the center and doing the same sort of thing on the center. It's a little hard to see from this angle. But I'm just flaring out the center of that donut. And upside down again, just to help support those walls. Improve the shape a little bit again. One of the reasons why you want your walls to be nice and even, even though once the ring is done, you're not going to see the edges, is that it, it changes how quickly the clay dries out. And so if you have some spots that are really thick and some spots that are really thin, they're gonna dry at different rates, they're gonna shrink at different rates, and you're gonna wind up with cracks. I've got those outside walls pretty much the way I want them. And so now we're just working on that inside. Turning those outside walls in again. And flaring those in, inside walls out. You can see I keep getting a crack there on the inside and that's a bit of a problem. So I'm really trying to work over that spot. Now I'm starting to think, hey, this might actually work. This has all been a vast experiment, remember? But it's starting to look like we're gonna be able to pull it together. Just need to be able to flare those walls out enough that I can turn them down to meet those outside walls. And now I've made it, I'm starting to do the seam around there. You can see there's still a little bit of a seam visible. But at this point, I'm just trying to get everything closed up. Once I get everything closed up, then because there's some air trapped in there, then that'll help it to retain its shape even as I'm working on it. So now I'm trying to get rid of that seam. There's a few thin spots, so I'm putting a little extra clay there. A few thick spots, so I'll scrape those down. At this point, I want to err on the side of having it be a little bit too thick, then a little bit too thin because the last thing I want to do is punch a hole through the top of this thing. Now it's looking pretty good. So I'm starting to smooth that out. Try and smooth that down as much as I can. I don't want to use a lot of pressure because even though there's air trapped in there, this is still a pretty dicey comp proposition. So I'm just actually using my fingers almost like a wet sandpaper to, um, to sand down those areas that are a little too high, little lumps. And then coming back around with that with that piece of gourd again. It has an inward curve on the inside, so that's nice because then I can use it to actually kind of make a consistent shape. So it actually helps me to create that rounded shape. Now this is really starting to get to where I want it to be. So I'm gonna do some final smoothing out at this stage, and then I'm gonna let the clay rest for a while. So I'm just gonna set it down, let it firm up, 
So it has a nap. I'll go have some lunch and we'll come back to it. And we're back. You can see how much firmer that is. I wasn't gone that long, but it just allows the clay to rest a little bit. And once again, I'm trying to smooth this out as much as I can. One of the reason I, reasons I'm being so fussy about how smooth it is at this stage is that once I polish it, every single little divot or irregularity is going to show up. And I know that. And at that point, there's nothing you can do about them. So here I'm just putting it on a uh, piece of cloth that's on a glass pie plate. And that's just so that I can turn it more easily. Just touching up that inner side. Checking it out. And we're going to flip it over again. Come around the edge a little bit there. And the white that you see there is just some dry clay that was on my hands. As I said, this is very much a tactile thing. And so it may look like I'm going around and around and around in circles and really not making much difference. But I can see and feel all of those little irregularities. And I'm checking it out from above, make sure it's nice and round. And at this point, what I'm doing is I'm using my fingers almost like wet sandpaper uh, just to smooth out that clay and get it nice and even. Every once in a while, I find a spot that needs a little extra care, and so I break out the gourd. But most of the time, I'm just smoothing down all those spots. It may be incredibly boring to watch, but it's actually very relaxing to do. You just have to listen to your fingers. Now we're flipping it over, a little bit of dry clay on there again. When I was learning rock climbing, my instructor said, trust your feet. And that's always stuck with me. And in this case, you need to trust your fingers. They'll guide you better than your eyes. Now I've gotten my fingers fairly wet to get kind of a slurry going there, just to get a nice, smooth, even surface. It's looking pretty good, just doing some final touch up here. And the next step is to make the spout.
So the same principle again, just trying to get a nice even thickness there. And then we'll curve it around to make the spout. I'm not too concerned about the shape of the ends at this stage because one of them is going to have to be curved to match the shape of the pot anyways. So getting that nice and smooth, even. And then trimming it. That's going to be the top side. And then just evening out that rim, trying to get it nice. Okay, now we've got our pot back. And we're going to put on that spout. So I've marked where it is, and now I'm using that, my little pink point to cut that out. And then shaping it to fit. And so now I'm creating essentially a weld all the way around there. So I'm taking some fairly damp clay and just smoothing that in so that I don't have a crack, I don't have a weak spot. Whenever you have things like spouts or handles, you want to take some extra time and just make sure that they're really, really well welded on there. This one's a little bit challenging because it's almost too tall for me to be able to get my finger in there on the other side. So now I'm smoothing that down. I'm not quite so concerned about that spot on the inside because that's actually going to be up against the handle. So you can see there's a little bit of a divot there, but I'm not too sure, not too concerned about that. I'm more concerned about what's going to be visible. And because it's so hard to get my finger all the way down in there, I keep kind of messing up the shape of that spout and having to reshape it. Now I'm just trying to catch any places where my fingers might have made a mark while I was putting that spout on. Make sure that it's all nice and smooth. And now we're about ready for the handle. True Confessions time here. I did actually make a handle previous to this and I decided I didn't like how it turned out. I decided that it was too thin. So I'm creating another one. You see me kind of thumping it on the edge of the table there uh, just to even out those sides. And then I'm going to start curving it. But I want it nice and smooth. Handles are always tricky. And I noticed once I got this pot finished that I had a little tiny hairline crack in the handle. And then I noticed that the original of this pot has a little tiny hairline crack in almost exactly the same spot. So I think it may just be the nature of the beast, particularly with this particular shape of pot. So now I'm just welding that handle on, just like I did with the spout. And 
more little tiny ribbons of clay in there at the base of that handle just to get it really well welded. Get it nice and smoothed out. And now I'm just tidying up. I'm using that piece of buckskin that I showed you earlier to help smooth the pot. It allows me to get into some of those cracks, especially where that handle joins the spout. You can't really get your finger in there, but you can slip a little piece of wet buckskin in there. And there we have it, our finished pot. Now all we have to do is paint it. The thing that makes the magic of black and white pottery is this white clay. This is really special stuff. It's a type of clay called smectite. It's actually in the same family as kitty litter. Like kitty litter, it expands a lot when you get it wet which means that it actually isn't very good for making pots because clays that expand a lot also crack a lot as they dry. White clay is actually pretty rare geologically too, which is one of the reasons why black on white pottery is so rare. It doesn't take much of this white clay to make a black on white pot because you just use it like a paint on the surface. My friend Andy Ward has done a great video about how white clay may have been traded around the Southwest between potters. I'll link to that. This white clay is mixed with water to make a pretty runny paint until it's nice and thin and slippery. That's why it's called slip. I told you we were, weren't very original about coming up with names. I call this my goodie basket. In it I have this little piece of beaver fur that my friend Mott's Merman, another accomplished rec replicator, gave me. It's a piece of an old beaver fur coat. The beaver who used to wear it may have died before I was born, but I appreciate both his and Matza's gift. It's perfect for laying down a nice, consistent layer of slip, though many people use just the side of their finger, and that's what I used for years. I also have an assortment of polished rocks that I use for polishing the pots. I'll talk about that later. Some of these I bought at a rock shop. This is probably the one I use the most. Since the shape varies a little, it helps keep your hand from getting fatigued because it can cha you can change the grip. This one is from my friend Andy. Isn't it beautiful? I don't use it a great deal, but I love the play of colors. This is another rock shop acquisition, but the V at the top is perfect for doing rims and edges of handles, and the other end is great for getting into nooks and crannies. These last two I do use a great deal. You can tell from how misshapen they are. They used to be perfect teardrop shapes, but they've worn down over time. And yes, I cheated. They came from the rock shop too. So now let's start slipping. At this point, the pot is just about leather hard. Uh, you can see from the color right up around the spout that it's actually a little bit drier there. And the handle too is a little bit drier, but generally speaking, we're, we're about leather hard. And so I'm coming in with my little beaver butt and I am putting on a fairly thin layer of slip here. You don't want the layer of slip to be terribly thick because if it is, then you're going to wind up with it cracking. So you're far further ahead to just put on a thin, several thin layers. And so on this pot, I actually put on three different layers of slip. 
And as I said before, if there are any spots that get missed, they're not going to be quite so obvious, particularly if they're just in a cranny somewhere, because this clay will turn much more gray. And we're winding up with this layer, and then we'll let it rest for a few minutes, just to let it set up a bit before we start the next layer. And the quality control staff has showed up to check on things and make sure I'm doing it properly. As you can see on this layer, I'm actually applying it at a right angle to the way that I was applying it the last time. That just helps ensure a little bit more even coverage. And I am being ably supervised, as you can see. And then I'm going to let it set up a little bit and come back for the last pass. The slip actually adds a fair amount of moisture to the pot each time you put it on. And so that's why we let it set up between the different layers of slip. Not terribly long, but just enough for that to absorb in a bit. And now you can see that I'm coming in here with the last pass, and I'm going actually in the same direction that I did on the first pass. And we have a final quality control check, and then once that's finished, it's ready for burnishing. Burnishing is one of those things that you either love or hate. Personally, I love it. It's a very zen, repetitive, and methodical process, and one that can be magical to watch. But to understand it, you need to know a little bit about the geology of clay. Most of us, when we think of clay, if we think of it at all, imagine it as just tiny particles of dirt, more or less like miniature sand. In fact, clay minerals are actually flat, plate-like structures. That's what makes burnishing possible. Starting when the slip is partially dry, you burnish it with a very smooth stone and light pressure. That pressure starts to flatten out the clay particles. As you go over the surface of the clay again and again as it gets drier, you flatten out those clay particles even more until they reflect the light uniformly and you wind up with an almost mirror-like surface. This is what the famous San Ildefonso potter Maria Martinez did to develop the brilliant shine on her characteristic black pottery. That isn't a glaze. That's just the polish she gave her pots with a smooth stone. The matte parts of the design were created by painting on a slip after she burnished. Because the clay particles in the slip weren't all even and flat, they don't reflect the light like the burnished portions do. At this stage, this is kind of a preliminary to burnishing. I'm just flattening out the surface a little bit more, smoothing it a bit down, uh, rather like I was doing with my fingers before, but we're just doing it a little bit further, just because I'm really determined to get a nice polish on this pot. The pot isn't dry here. It's again just a little past leather hard. Remember each layer of slip that I've added to it has added some moisture. Now what I'm doing is I'm coming in with just a tiny bit of water on that piece of buckskin and that is going to smooth everything out even more. I have to be very, very light on the amount of water that I add here, because if I add too much, then the clay will absorb it, expand, and crack. And that's the last thing I want at this stage. Oh, 
Okay, now I'm coming in and actually doing the burnishing. You'll gradually see a change in the color as it gets burnished. It actually turns a little bit more gray as all of those particles are pushed down. You can see that here a little bit on the handle. And as I said, although burnishing is extremely soothing to do, it's also extremely boring to watch. So I'm actually going to cut it off here and take this out on the deck and work on it and we'll come back in just a moment and see the result. And here we have it, our perfectly burnished pot. You can see there's a couple little chips around the edge of the spout there. That's always a problem. But you can also see how high that shine is that I've managed to get. The sad thing is that it's not going to keep that shine for very long for two reasons. As the pot dries, it continues to shrink a little bit, and so those plates aren't going to lay very flat anymore, but at this stage I can't polish it any further because it's dried enough that it'll just scratch the surface rather than laying those plates flat. And also, when it's fired, again, it shrinks in the firing, so we'll lose some of that polish, but I enjoy it while we've got it. We now have the white. Now we just need the black paint that we're going to put on the white slip. Incidentally, just to prove we aren't original, if a pottery is called black on white, it's because it is black paint on a white slip. If it were white paint on a black slip, that would be called white on black. Some groups used minerals for their paints. Manganese and iron oxide were common. Up in the northern sections near Mesa Verde and Blanding, they generally used organic paint. We don't really know from the archaeological record what the ancestral Puebloans used for their organic black paint, but a hundred years or so ago their living descendants were using Rocky Mountain bee plant. There are other plants that can be used, such as wild sunflowers, but bee plant is what replicators use most. This beautiful plant is related to the garden flower called Cleome, or spider flower, and will grow chest high in a good year. I gathered it up, the whole thing, flowers, seeds, stems, leaves, and put it in a big pot with water and raised it to a boil. After it turned a nice dark tea color, I strained out all the plant bits and then just kept boiling the tea down until it made a thick syrup, like maple syrup. Then I poured it into a dish and let it dry, and this is the result. One decidedly inauthentic th thing that I use is these nail tees. I find that they're perfect for cleaning up little airs in my painting. Of course, the ancient Puebloans didn't use them, but they were much better painters than I, too. Of course, if you're going to paint something, you need a paintbrush. Puebloan potters in modern times have used yucca leaves, and that's what I prefer. Though some folks have tried brushes made with human hair, and there are a few that prefer just to use a regular paintbrush. Usually, you soak the leaf for a while so that it's easy to remove the flesh from the strands that run up the inside of the leaf. You can use any number of things to do this, a fingernail, a piece of wood or bone, or in a pinch, your teeth. But if you try that, you better have a glass of water nearby. Yucca won't hurt you, but it's like getting your mouth washed out with soap. In fact, the Puebloans used yucca root as a soap and a shampoo, and the state plant of New Mexico is a type of yucca called the soap tree. So let's start painting. Here I have a yucca brush and you can see how the fibers in the leaf have formed this nice long straight brush. The fibers are sticking together a little bit right now because they're damp. And I also have my beeweed paint here. I'm going to start out with a very thin brush and I'm going to start out on the lines on the handle. 
going to start at the top and work my way down. That way I can, can still grab hold of my pot and turn it to work on it without messing up the sides. If I were doing a bowl, I would start at the inside and work towards the rim so that I could still hold the bowl. One of the wonderful things about yucca brushes is how they create this fabulous straight line. Since watching someone paint is only slightly more exciting than watching the paint dry, I'm going to jump ahead and uh, come back to you at a couple of different points and tell you what I'm up to. So I've finished the lines on the handle now. I'm going to switch brushes. I'm going to switch over to this thicker brush. This is a thinner brush I've been using. And I'm going to use that thicker brush to fill in the black parts of the motif. That's one of the wonderful things about yucca brushes is that you can make them whatever size you want. You'll notice that I do have the pattern sketched in on the pot. I did that in pencil. I'm not concerned about that long term because pencil is graphite and graphite is carbon. So that's all just going to burn out in the fire and it won't show at all. There's some debate about what the ancient Puebloan potters used in order to sketch in their patterns or if they used anything at all. They may have used charcoal, once again, carbon burns out in the fire. Although there are some absolutely amazing modern Puebloan potters who can freehand the most intricate designs and get them perfectly the first time. Speaking of doing things perfectly, I'm managing to mess up my line here. And so I'll show you another technique that I frequently use to clean up little mistakes. It's probably more authentic than the nail tees, although I use it more because it's expedient than because it is more authentic. And that is to just come in with the back side of that leaf that I'm using to paint with and just scraping away a little bit of the paint. It's critical that there not be any trace of the paint left because when we fire this, the areas that are painted, including any fingerprints or anything like that, are going to show up. Here we come up with one of the other challenges that replicators face, and that's just the absence of information. As you can see, the spout on the original was broken off. So I had to simply draw in a pattern that I thought fit with the rest of the pot and with similar patterns. The other challenge is how big is it? In this case, we do have a scale bar in the corner and that's 10 centimeters or four inches long. So that gave me a little bit of an idea of how big this actually was in the original. And there's the finished product. The Tularosa style jar next to mine was made by Rod Dotson and the corrugated pitcher is by Kelly Magleby. These pots were all fired at the 2023 Southwest Kiln Conference held at Edge of the Cedar State Park in Blanding. Kelly acted as our kiln boss this year and did a great job. I said that we sling the pots into a roaring great bonfire and hope for the best, but that was a bit of an exaggeration. We start out by warming them up very gradually by the fire. Regardless of how well you dry your pots, there's always a little bit of water remaining. So if you do sling it into a roaring great bonfire, that water will immediately turn to steam and blow your pot apart. So you warm them up gradually to allow the heat to force that water out. Black and white pottery, at least those that have organic paint, like mine, have to be fired in a particular type of kiln. We find these in the archaeological record. As you can see, we have a long trench lined with pieces of sandstone. A kiln like this is called, go figure, a trench kiln. Remember what I was saying about naming things? That first fire is called a primary fire and it would be followed by, yeah, the secondary fire. 
The primary fire was built out until we had a good bed of coals. We also had a few spits of rain at the absolute worst time. So it was all hands on deck to keep the pots dry and get the kiln loaded. And I don't have any pictures of that process. You can see the result here, however. The kiln was furnished with some pieces of sandstone to keep the pots from direct contact with the coals. We call that kiln furniture. The pots were carefully placed on the furniture and covered with pieces of fired pottery. In our case, most of these are purpose-made, but the ancestral Puebloans, who had a lot more bro broken crockery lying around, probably covered with large shirts of pottery. Regardless, we call those, you guessed it, cover shirts. A latticework of wood was laid over the top and then it was set alight. In conjunction with the periodic spits of rain, the wind came up too, so the fire got pretty big pretty fast, more so than it normally would. Once the fire had died down to coals, we smothered it thoroughly with dirt. This is one of the key steps in creating black on white pottery, and it is a hotly contended subject amongst replicators. About the only part we agree on is that the ancient Puebloans weren't raving around metal shovels to smother them with. The point of smothering the fire isn't just to keep Smokey the Bear happy, it is also to seal out the oxygen at a point when the pots are still hot enough that the carbon from the smoke won't get deposited on them and discolor them and to keep the oxygen out until the pots cool enough that that isn't a concern. So we left the pots to cool until the next day and, as always, felt like little kids waiting for Christmas morning. The next morning we broke out the shovels again and unwrapped our kiln, the moment of truth. Will it be the thrill of victory or the agony of a broken pot? Organic painted pottery, like mine, has one more big reveal to come. The paint leaves behind a thin layer of white ash that has to be wiped away to reveal the design. And there you have it. A replica of an 800 year old Ancestral Puebloan ring canteen. Authentic right down to the hairline crack in the handle. And that's it, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Please feel free to put any questions that you may have down in the comments field down below. And please join me next time and learn why Boxing Day has nothing to do with sports and very little to do with boxes. And we'll help those less fortunate than we are into the bargain. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you'll know when my next video goes up.